So I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to today's webinar and welcome to the Urban Tree Festival. Uh, today's webinar is on the politics of Sheffield's commemorative World War I street trees. My name's Sarah Shawley and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Urban Tree Festival as well as the Woodland Trust where I work in campaigning for urban woods and trees. The mass felling of trees in Sheffield and the protests that ensued sparked national and even international interest. And in today's webinar, we will hear about how a residential avenue in Sheffield became one of the most divisive focal points in the protests against tree felling in Sheffield, when a century old memorial to soldiers who died during the First World War was threatened with felling. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Camilla Allen. Camilla is a landscape architect and environmental historian who, along with Dr. Jan Woodstra, has edited The Politics of Street Trees, which is now published by Rootledge. Camilla is currently working as a teacher in the Department of Landscape Architecture, a tutor on the Oxford University Department of Continuing Education course on English Garden History, and at Manchester School of Architecture as Research Associate on Women of the Welfare Landscape Project. Thank you all for attending this event today. We hope you enjoy it. Um, please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be available later on on the Urban Tree Festival YouTube channel. Uh, we'd love it if you could pop your questions in the Q&A um, and we'll take those at the end of the webinar. So over to Camilla. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, let me just do a little bit of minimizing here. Stick that up at the top. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I've been immersed in the politics of street trees for a few years now, but it's very delightful just to share um, one particular part of it, um, which is my chapter on Sheffield's commemorative street trees. The chapter, oh, as I get used to moving through my slides, um, the chapter is part of this book, um, yeah, as Sarah mentioned, uh, recently published. So The Politics of Street Trees, which in the words of Tom Williamson, who's one of the um, professors in the University of East Anglia, described as deftly weaving together narratives of politics and landscape, um, bringing a fresh international perspective to the con complex and contested subject of urban trees. Uh, it's something that we are immensely proud of. It's um, a enterprise we've been working on for um, the best part of three years and so it's exciting that it's now out in the world. And it's something that is very particular to Sheffield. Um, David Blunkett, who's the Baron of Brightside and Hillsborough in the city of Sheffield, wrote the foreword for the book and um, put it rather, rather well. Ironic that there should have been a row about the felling of trees in the city that is renowned for its open spaces, its woodland and its greenery, with a third of the city itself in the Peak District National Park, and with every claim to having more trees than any other urban conurbation in Europe, a combination of outsourced renewal and renovation of roads and pavements, a stubborn bureaucracy and poor statescraft, led to a politically damaging outcome, but lessons to be learned and acted on in the future. And very much the spirit of the book um, is examining those lessons to be learned, not just from Sheffield, but actually drawing upon international and interdisciplinary stories and case studies, uh, perspectives we have from um, lawyers, from activists, from ecologists, um, from urban foresters, from historians, um, you know, the the, the gamut is wide. We've got 28 different chapters by over 40 contributors. And very much that spirit of how we act upon this in the future is at the heart of it. Um, the book closes with the charter for street trees, and that's something that we want to take forward. And it's something that has felt very current again in Sheffield. Um, some of you may be aware that a film came out earlier this year by Jackie Bellamy and Eve Wood called The Felling, um, which took a protester's eye view as to what happened and unfolded in Sheffield. And alongside that, um, a book by Simon Crump and Calvin Payne called Persons Unknown, that uh, again acts as an amazing account of what took place in Sheffield from the point of view of the people who were mobilised to fight for the trees. And it's not just a Sheffield issue. 
Um, there are many points over the last few years. I mean, the, the situation in Sheffield has unfolded over the last eight to 10, but um, you know, in London with the construction of HS2, we've had the controversy of felling trees around Euston Station. And I was struck by this image that actually um, all of my pride, um, all of my pride in publishing this book was tempered in March um, as it came out with the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Um, this image of the destruction in Bucha, um, I think uh, I found particularly saddening yet also heartening um, as a woman walks down a street surrounded by broken, destroyed tanks, yet with a line of trees um, still standing, still robust in the face of conflict. And that is one of the themes that has emerged in the book, actually trees as a tool, both of commemoration, but also of healing. Um, and that is in part what I'll be talking about today. In December 2017, Sheffield's councillors voted on, one, on a motion to address the fate of 41 trees that had been planted during and after the First World War on streets in Sheffield, and decided that a £500,000 price tag to retain them was too great. In doing so, the councillor's decision created one of the street tree crisis' most iconic battlefields, with Western Road, which faced the loss of 25 of 54 remaining trees, becoming the focal point of one of the most emotive clashes of the protest. The trees encapsulated many of the tensions that had been brought to the fore by the issue, not least that the money that it would take to work around them would be taken from the city's already stretched social care budget. Emotions ran high with parades and vigils, and the language used reflected the strength of feeling with one local paper imploring the council to rethink plans to cut down the trees that had been planted to remember victims of the war. It appeared that a covenant between the local authority and the people had been broken, one that had been forged through the sacrifices of World War I and which had become the council's responsibility to uphold the maintenance of Sheffield's living memorials to the soldiers lost in the conflict. In an attempt to challenge this decision, men, some serving in the forces and all dressed in Great War uniforms, had marched from Sheffield's train station to the council building in March that year and on to the threatened trees. The council had hoped that a conciliatory proposal to plant 300 trees in the city's parks as new memorials to the war would create permanent places of commemoration rather than the problematic tree stock. However, the public consultation organised by the local authority was not enough to satisfy residents that all possible alternatives were being considered. And the feeling was that the council was willfully desecrating a war memorial. The War Memorials Trust issued a statement encouraging the preservation of as many of the original trees as possible. The replacement, if necessary, with trees of a similar age, size and species and the involvement of the community in any decisions about the trees. Local residents also started a crowdfunding campaign to conserve and restore the trees, potentially back to the 97 originally planted on Western Road, with a broader aim of bringing people together and transcending the street tree furore through a community-led programme for enhancing and increasing the city's street trees. The tone of the debate continued to escalate with one campaigner suggesting that the contractor would have the blood of the war dead on their hands and a relative of one of the soldiers suggesting that her great uncle, having given up his life for the country, deserved better. The fate of the Western Road trees brought people together in a way that differed from the attempts otherwise made to polarise the issue and the crisis cut across otherwise entrenched political and social groups. The trees were recognised as icons for the local community. And despite differing levels of engagement with the campaign, the fate of the Western Road trees represented a common cause which transcended much of the debate.
November 2018 saw a reprieve being granted for 32 of the 35 trees on Western Road and the cabinet member responsible stated that the cessation would still be accompanied by the planting of 300 extra memorial trees. Furthermore, a consultation was to begin on the possibility of replacing trees that had been lost in the intervening decades. The mooted consultation on replacing trees, as well as the continued commitment to plant new memorial trees, meant that both the century old trees, as well as new avenues and single tree plantings, were part of the council's program as the local authority to both commemorate World War I, as well as all subsequent conflicts, and to develop mechanisms of perpetuation so as to ensure their future. One aspect of the council's plans was to protect the new trees by dedicating the sites as centenary fields in trust, securing them as recreational spaces to honour the memory of the lives lost in the war, despite the rather confusing assertion that the new tree plantings would also serve as memorials to the Normandy landings in anticipation of the 75th anniversary in 2019. The debate over Sheffield's memorial trees contributed to a political crisis in the city, garnering some of the worst press coverage for the beleaguered local authority, as well as reinforcing the identification of the trees as living war memorials. However, a closer look at the War Memorial Trust's letter in support of retaining the trees states that memorials in general present many repair and conservation challenges without adding the extra caveat that memorials created using trees and other plants also bring maintenance and replacement issues quite different to those involved in perpetuating something made in stone, brick or glass. Therefore, the argument made here is that the care and perpetuation of Sheffield's living memorials became a divisive issue of desecration and destruction by the local authority, rather than a democratic debate about, about how best to perpetuate the memory and appreciation of the sacrifices made during World War I through a care for the environment. This tension, as will be demonstrated, was present from the beginning, and the idea of living memorials was never anything other than a political issue. Sheffield, along with many other northern industrial towns, had suffered disproportionate losses during the war, with the Battle of the Somme encapsulated as a loss of life, two years in the making, 10 minutes in the destroying. As many of the young men who had volunteered in 1914 walked into machine gun fire near the town of Sayre, the story of the Sheffield Pals Battalion makes the felling of trees planted in their memory all the more challenging. However, it has not yet been framed within the debate that took place in, at the time about how the city, as a social and political entity, could recognise their sacrifice and how that affected the environment in Sheffield, along with the aspiration such memorials represented as a rapprochement between the city's industrial identity and its populace. Rather than test the merits of either side in the most recent debate about Sheffield Street Trees, I will explore the in issue of commemoration during and after the war through an examination of what was discussed and intended at the time and pose the question, does the term living memorial mean the same thing to contemporary audiences as it did at the time? And if a more nuanced understanding of a living memorial is reached, how might that affect the way in which we manage and restore commemorative tree plantings in the future? Drawing upon literature of commemoration and memorialization, the local history of the 12th Battalion York and Lancaster Regiment and archival material drawn from newspapers and public records, I propose that the covenant between the city and its people, although damaged, could be remade through a new understanding of the sacrifices made and the intention with which the original tree plantings took place. Underlying the debate about the fate of the Western Road trees was not just that they had been planted in the spirit of commemoration, 
but also that they were almost a proxy for the graves which families had been denied by the unprecedented circumstances of the war. Yet memorials to soldiers, blah, blah, blah. Yet memorials to soldiers prior to World War I are uncommon, and most of the men who died on battlefields were left without any mark at all, buried in haste to stop the spread of disease. The First World War was fought on an unprecedented scale, and the complexities of identifying, burying, and memorializing the dead resulted in a new language of commemoration and memorialization, both at home and on the battlefields. The issue was political from the start, with the decision made in March 1915 not to repatriate the bodies of any British Imperial troops to anywhere in the empire. Although it might have been possible for wealthy families to undertake such a task, it was beyond the means of most. The shock of the morale of communities from which the predominantly northern and traditionally unmilitary PALS battalions were drawn, like Sheffield, were anticipated as being the hardest hit. Along with all of the human lives lost, the impact upon the landscapes of the Western Front became part of the war's haunting iconography. The shattered trunks of trees, the despoilation of the earth, all highlighted, all heightened in the eerie paintings of the war artists, in which nature was another casualty and which has unavoidably informed our understanding of the conflict. Trees played an emotive part in Britain's reimagining of the post-war landscape, with a proposition made by one officer for a via sacra along the Western Front, indicating the way in which a future pilgrimage could be ameliorated by fruit and by shade. After the war, momentum gathered behind projects like Roads for Remembrance, which aspired to hold universal benefits and have permanence, creating something that would last for all time. However, the investment in infrastructure proposed by the Roads for Remembrance Committee was much more focused upon bridges and road surfaces than upon creating memorial avenues as a form of commemoration. Trees as memorials represent a temporal challenge, often not developing into the groves that were intended or presenting management challenges as planting schemes evolve. The, pot the potentially truculent behavior of the li living elements of war memorials outlined here gives weight to the difficult decisions that contemporary custodians of memorial landscapes must address. The National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire sets out some important caveats about the movement of plaques and ded the dedication and rededication of trees, stating that although moving plaques is far from ideal, we hope that you understand that the future development of the Arboretum would be impossible otherwise. We take our roles as guardians of remembrance seriously and believe that these challenges are important for the overall good of the site. Yet none of these issues are new. Commemorative tree planting was an issue in 1922 when the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University reported that although the use of trees as memorials was popular to remember soldiers who had lost their lives, the use of trees as memorials presented a range of problems from species selection, which resulted in either incongruous mixes of natives and exotics, an ignorance of any existing planting plan, or little thought to the shorter lifespan of trees, with the emphasis being that any memorial tree should be selected so as to have the longest lifespan possible. Such an intention demonstrates the clear fallibility of living memorials, as opposed to the more enduring nature of mon monuments carved out of stone, not least that their creators wanted to be outlived by their memorials. Furthermore, as opposed to the celebration of victory, which had typified many types of monument before World War I, the scale of the impact across the nations involved necessitated different memorials. Communities became responsible for memorialization with either static symbolic memorials, such as crosses, obelisks, figures, or stained glass windows, or more functional civic structures, such as libraries, halls, hospitals, parks, and allotments. 
all of the latter were considered living memorials. And the choices as to the symbolism or utility of these memorials was descriptive of deep divisions of class, politics and culture, coupled with divided opinions about the war. Over time, the symbolic memorials have remained visible as foci of annual commemoration, whereas memorial landscapes and um, utilities face unique threats and require different modes of protection and recognition. The term living memorial proved to be even more elastic, sometimes interchangeable with peace memorials, with the hope that the more tranquil remobilization of nature would facilitate health and happiness for all. The form that memorials took had to tread a delicate balance between a resistance to glorification of the sacrifice of war, whilst also comforting the bereaved and reassuring them that there was meaning in their loss. During and after the war, memorialization upon and near the battlefields focused upon the individual, finding equality between aristocratic officers and working class soldiers through a rigorous recording and identification of every life lost. Historians' interest in this language of memorialization has in turn, eclip has in turn eclipsed the public discourse about what happened to the soldiers' dead bodies, instead focusing upon the memorial practices and architectonic features of cemeteries. Furthermore, over the intervening years, much of the complexity and tension that accompanied the creation of cemeteries and memorials has been obscured by the dominant forms that commemoration has taken. The scholar Paul Goff notes that memorials have become bound up with an idealized form of reverence in a way that obscures their alternative role as foci for protest, political agitation, and dissent. Key to the campaign to save the Western Road trees and the other war memorial trees was that they had been planted by distinct communities in Sheffield. The trees on Western Road and Gillett Street were dedicated to students from the Western Road Council School and their descendants were aghast that the trees that had been planted for them could be cut down. The inscription that marks the trees states that they were planted in grateful appreciation of the part taken by former pupils of this school in the Great War, 1914 to 1919. The trees on Western Road and Gillett Street were planted on the 4th of April, 1919. Whereas the streets, the trees on Tay Street, outside what was then the Crooksmoor School, were planted in March, 1917. And the dedication plaque carries the poem to the shrine, lift your eyes, let your voices arise. You are up at the top, Crooksmoor. There is no mention of the Pals Brigade or the song, but the specific loss of life, as well as the wider contribution to the war effort that the students from both schools made is clear in both. Sheffield, was one of several northern industrial cities who formed their own battalions, part of Kitchener's army, which was first raised by local industrialists, city councillors and concerned citizens and became iconic symbols of the wartime volunteering spirit. These battalions, made up of men from all walks of life, held dual names. Thus, the 12th Battalion York and Lancaster Regiment was unofficially known as the Sheffield City Battalion and other Yorkshire and Lancaster formations went by the name of the Bradford Pals, Barnsley Pals and the Miners Battalion. What began as a cohesive and socially homogenous group of volunteers in Sheffield was then diluted and dispersed by the necessity to reappoint men to different roles in the wartime economy. Some men were promoted to offices, others to roles in the munition factories, whilst others were dismissed as being underage or unfit for active service. The men of the Sheffield City Battalion were a visible sight within the city, training first at the Bramall Lane Football Club and later at Redmire's on the edge of the Peak District, where traces of the training trenches that they dug still remain. The battalion was first sent to Egypt to protect the Suez Canal, 
But when the tension there de-escalated, they were transferred to the Western Front and on the 1st of July, 1916, found themselves near the heavily guarded town of Serre. The assault was a disaster, with a battalion of over 1,000 men reduced by almost half through death, injury, and the disappearance of men whose bodies were never recovered. Seven years later, the sacrifice and loss of life was remembered at a service in Sheffield Cathedral described as showing the love that the city had for its own battalion and attended by survivors, relatives, friends and representatives from the life of the city. The service coincided with the unveiling of the York and Lancaster Regiment in Western Park, as well as one in Stair. The Bishop remarked that the anniversary stood firstly for comradeship, that the men had persuaded one another to join and rather than coming from military families, they were bred in the arts of peace. And despite the service of the Sheffield men in other regiments of the British Army, the city battalion represented Sheffield as such. The grief that the bishop alluded to was countered by another churchman, Canon Spencer Elliott, who at a following service in St Paul's Church, Sheffield, chided his congregation by saying that he wondered sometimes whether they really remembered their loved ones who gave their lives in the war and that remembrance should make them unselfish and less inclined to complain. The two clerics comments present diverging views of those who had lost their lives, the city that they came from and the lives of those left behind. Including the loss of life at Serre, around 5,000 of Sheffield citizens died during the war the conflict affected the form and function of the city, with industry shifting to munitions, women joining the workforce and the German bombing of factories. At the point at which the seventh anniversary of the Somme took place, Britain was in the grip of a depression with high unemployment, deflation and stagnant economic growth. It was within this environment that those who survived found themselves and it is within the tensions that were felt in the city that the planting of trees between 1917 and 1919 becomes even more interesting, not least because they appear to be the most discreet and the least contentious of any of the acts of commemoration in the city. Sheffield's newspapers hold a unique record of the discourse in the city in relation to the tree plantings. The first in March 1917 was on Tay Street outside Crooksmore Council School in honour of the old boys of the school who were in the forces. Mr E Snellgrove, a former master, had conceived the idea and the trees were to be accompanied by a roll of honour recording the names of all of the former pupils who had joined up. Inspired by this planting, a Sheffield councillor, Mr K, decided to plant the upper part of Oxford Street, which then linked the school to the tram route to Walkley. Contributions to the tree planting were made by the school children who paraded on the streets during the planting ceremony. The council's park staff advised on the choice of trees and supervised the planting. The newspaper reported that at the time, 560 names had been secured for the role of honour, but that it was believed that there were many more and that they welcomed any additions to the list. Later that year, the momentum behind the memorialization that would accompany the end of the war became more loaded. Writing in the Sheffield Telegraph, one commentator repeated the adage that nothing in modern English taste is so bad as in our public monuments, and that Sheffield would be well served to create along any artistic monuments, memorial groves in one or each of the city's parks. These trees would mean that innumerable generations of Sheffielders could rest beneath the shade of the Somme Oaks and reflect upon this heroic time and keep the hero's memory green. The suggestion was met with support by another reader, Mr W Greaves, Honorary Secretary of the Midland Reforesting Association, who likened the proposed tree plantings to those undertaken by Queen Victoria. Areas of waste land in the city could be beautified by tree planting 
and would also purify the atmosphere and also preserve water supplies. Mr Greaves' aspirations for tree planting also aligned with a common concern at the time that despite trees being a valuable and important asset, reserves of timber were low compared to other countries. He also put forward the suggestion that to plant trees as a memorial in acrostic form, the first letter of the species and the first letter of the soldier's name should be the same. In a similar manner to Victoria's planting at Ainsford in Kent, in which the tree spelt out the name of a Tennyson poem. Technical difficulties aside, the aspiration was that such plantings would be educational and would encourage people to take a greater interest in one of the greatest friends of man. The discussion continued in 1918 with another letter extolling the excellent idea of planting trees, not just in memory of the fallen, but also for the appreciation of the living as well as the dead, so that those who returned would be able to gaze upon the memorial trees and rejoice at the sight, both for themselves and their unreturning comrades. Furthermore, the point was made that for many of the returning soldiers, their heroism would only otherwise be recognised upon their death many years later, missing the opportunity to hold them up as examples to others during their lifetime. The following month, another reader pointed out the opportunities for planting trees in many of Sheffield's gardens. The writer B. H. Lucas suggested that if there could be a neighbourly amalgamation of sympathy for such a movement in every house of any one street, to each plant a similar variety of any of the above and all of the same age and weight, say six feet, in three years there would be a transformed appearance of charm and arboreal beauty and they would represent in many homes a living touch of in memoriam. Arboreal poetry was balanced by practical management in his next letter in which he relayed his experience as forester and head gardener to the county borough of Barrow in Furness and which was closed with the assertion that all sensible comment is an aid to the attainment of memorial tree planting and a more beautiful Sheffield. Lucas then followed with an even more passionate call for trees to be planted as, in his opinion, although bronze or stone memorials had their place, trees gave unique consolation and comfort to the parents of fallen soldiers, providing a visible manifestation of growth and development that they had been denied by the war the nearest symbolic likeness or reminder of the loved one's lost babyhood, childhood, boyhood, youth and manhood. Following the armistice, other schools followed suit and in April 1919, nearly 100 sycamore and plane trees were planted on Western Road and Gillett Street to commemorate the sacrifice and service of its former pupils, both living and dead. 401 former pupils were remembered in the service, 64 who had died, and 12 who had been awarded distinctions. The article notes that the trees were intended, in, intended to beautify the district, and the inscription states that they were planted in appreciation of the contribution to the war made by the students. A memorial tablet for those who had lost their lives was to be created and placed in the hall of the school. The tree planting ceremony was preceded by an address by the Reverend V.W. Pearson, who reminded the scholars that those who had died in the song were among the brightest and best of Sheffield's young men, and it remained for the children to make Sheffield a place worth saving, and that the trees would beautify streets and beautify lives. The, the debate during the war had elevated trees to the medium of memorial, as well as the street tree plantings demonstrating an achievable commemorative activity in which the community could participate. As well as the trees around the Crooksmoor and Western Road Council schools, some were planted on Binfield Road in Mearsbrook and at the joint cost of certain persons in the Highway Committee. The Council's Highway and Schools Committees record the administrative processes that supported the tree plantings with the local authority providing trees and doing the planting, 
sharing some of the costs and fixing tree guards. Meanwhile, a more intimate scheme took place near the Crooks Congregational Church, who dedicated seven trees to the young men from their congregation who had fallen during the war, with six trees planted on Springvale Road and one on Cobden View Road at the cost of 50 shillings, which was two pounds and 10 shillings. In comparison, alongside the trees, the church committee also commissioned a memorial at a cost of 20 pounds, as well as a stone to be carved and placed near the vestry door, which was carved at a cost of four pounds and 10 shillings. Many other communities and congregations in Sheffield created memorials for their loved ones, and it is possible that many more trees were planted to commemorate the war. Rec records of such schemes are few and are totally outweighed by the volumes of minutes and correspondence relating to the creation of symbolic memorials, such as crosses and obelisks. A letter to the Sheffield Telegraph in April 1919 took to task the planned extension of Sheffield's cathedral as a memorial, with one reader asking whether specific elements were to be recorded, a list of men who had died, those who had won honours, the battles fought by the Sheffield battalions, and lastly, the story of Sheffield's contribution to the war, more remarkable and important than that of any other industrial community in the world. Later that year, the arrival of a tank which had been awarded to the city as a permanent memorial to the city's financial efforts for the war was trailed by the newspaper. The tank, weighing around 26 tonnes, needed a permanent resting place that had all the advantages of strength allied with public easy, easy public access. When the nearby town of Chesterfield's tank had arrived, the ceremony of presentation set out people's dislike of armoured vehicles as memorials. In the captain's speech, it was suggested that although they were seen as unesthetic, there had never been a pretense to the contrary. Tanks were instruments of death and destruction, and that made them appropriate as a memorial to a phenomenally deadly and destructive war. It's very grimness, making it a particularly apt and instructive souvenir. The strength of feeling in the captain's dress exemplified the tensions that emerged with the creation of more complex and expensive memorials. In Sheffield, the design and cost of a memorial in the city centre was a subject of fierce debate, with one commentator decrying the ambivalence to survivors when all the focus was on honouring the heroic dead. The writer and almoner for the regimental homes of the Sherwood Foresters suggested that the money raised for memorials be put towards more fitting and doubly blessed memorials for both the comrades who had been lost and those who needed care. Another idea, seeing that the war was fought for an ideal, was that any memorial should be idealistic and not utilitarian, that the dead would be honoured by caring for the living. The proposal was that Ecclesall Wood could be acquired and dedicated in perpetuity to the people, and that within the woodland a clearing could be made as a setting of monuments erected by the Sheffield units and the design left to the discretion of the soldiers and their friends. It is necessary to read between the lines, and despite the increasingly rambling suggestions that the woods could also be modified to create a lake, a tea pagoda, and a zoo of hardy animals, the letter also hints at the heartache of parents, such as the author of the letter, who wanted something worthy of their son's sacrifice. In this, it does not address the sacrifices made across the city, but the particular loss of life in the armed forces and something that would be an imperishable shine for ages to come for the people of Sheffield. Yet this elaborate Parker Shrine distracted in some people's minds from the real memorials of war. Writing in the Sheffield Daily Telegraph in 1919, one resident communicated in a short but succinct manner, the social contract that had been broken. So, with so many living war memorials round about us. Would it not be the most fitting to vote to devote what funds we can towards helping the widows and orphans of those who have made the supreme sacrifice 
and especially our poor blinded heroes and the crippled and maimed. Surely these are our, these are our living war memorials and surely they are worthy of the very best that lies in our power to do for them. Not a charity, but as a duty for the great sacrifices on our behalf. Let the stained glass windows and crosses, obelisks, etc. wait at least for a while. This covenant, that sacrifice would be rewarded with care, was a political issue. Widows' pensions, jobs for disabled ex-servicemen, housing, education, even afforestation, were issues that affected people's lives and which were shaped by the national government and local authorities in the years after the war, with varying levels of success. In such a context, the planting of street trees in Sheffield represented a subtle and affordable form of commemoration for some institutions and individuals, the real scale of which we may never know. It appears that the trees were living memorials in the sense that they contributed to the city environmentally, emotionally, and aesthetically. A much smaller number were planted as direct memorials to fallen soldiers in which a single tree represented a single life. And the term living memorial held weight as a means of expediating buildings and facilities for communities, which yet which often became mired in conflict as to whom these buildings and facilities excluded and the suggestion that there could be a better use of the funds. The idea that Sheffield's living memorials were neither, and were in fact the people widowed, orphaned or maimed by the war, makes an uneasy parallel with the difficult decision that the council felt that they had to make 100 years later. Find the money for an expensive restoration of the trees on Western Road or protect the social care budget. For decades after the trees were planted on Western Road and around Sheffield, Annual ceremonies took place to remember the privations, sacrifices and loss of the war. However, it appears that over the years, the services dwindled and the tree's significance as foci of remembrance diminished. This mellowing of grief might suggest that the intention in planting the trees and the comfort that they gave to the bereaved also dissipated over time. Over the intervening decades, the realities of life and death in the sylvan world took its toll. By the time the fury of the Western Road trees had reached its height, just over half the original avenue remained. Trees whose end was not contested, probably falling foul to disease, vehicles or development. This is not to lessen the remaining tree significance. Yet it does indicate that the spirit in which they were planted represented an aspiration of the covenant between the city of Sheffield and its cities had also been lost sight of. When the local authority took on the maintenance of the trees, it also took on the maintenance of the memory of sacrifice and loss. The trees themselves are not a manifestation of that covenant, but they represent the aspiration that the city would be worthy of the sacrifice and service during the war. And that is something to carry forward in the political discourse in Sheffield today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you ever so much, Camilla, for that really uh, inspiring, powerful talk and for the powerful images that, that joined your talk, I think, speak, speaks volumes. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a couple of questions that I'll put to you now. If you have any further questions for, for Camilla, please do pop those in the Q&A now or, or in the chat where I can pick those up. Um, but I think uh, first we, we had a question from, from somebody who's appearing as D. Um, asking how, how do you know that the Western Road trees were planted in April 1919? Uh, Dee was contacted by the founder of the Western Road Group and was, who was positive that the trees were planted in 1918 before, before the war ended. I've seen there's a, a response from Sarah um, with a link to the Imperial War Museum's website. But I, I, I guess there's a challenge you face as a historian in, in terms of checking on the, the accuracy of where these dates are coming from. So. Yeah, it could be good to hear from you. So, yeah, the, the, the major, and I guess that's one thing about a presentation like this, is um, most of the source material that I drew upon was from local newspapers. 
so any any dates that I quoted was what was recorded in the in probably the Sheffield Telegraph actually would be the place in all of those all those instances, which is an amazing you know it's an amazing resource. Um, there is so much, and I, I sort of barely scraped the surface with what is in there in terms of the debates that were taking place in Sheffield and the, like I said, I think there were many other points which you know, may not even be have been accurately covered. So, you know, it could be that they planted some of the trees in 1918 and some of them in 1919 and dedicated them. And, you know, it only takes one person to make a slip in writing up an article for that to go down on the record as one thing and not the other. But I think in, in general, I think what for me is important is the fact that the trees around Crooksmore School were planted that little bit earlier. Um, that it was already a process that was underway during the war and that actually it sat outside a lot of the conversations about what happened after the war. That's really interesting and, and the fact that this planting is happening in the war kind of points to the, the way in which trees are seen as, as that sign of healing and hope that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk you know they're tools of commemoration but healing and that kind of looking forward to the future um i think uh, Dee's just Dee's just said thanks camilla one of my uncles died as a world war one sherwood forester his grave is in oh. france with thousands of others which is fascinating and and is another connection to trees isn't it you know we needed foresters that you know we, we saw the the painting of or the photograph of the mm. ammunitions being being created you know built in in factories but that kind of real wood his, woodland history and and the way that trees have been used as a resource uh, as well as a heal healing and sign of hope they they've had so you know trees play their part in so many different ways um, and I, I guess that that really comes across in your book very much very much um we we do it would be good to hear from you more on whether uh, there are other forms of a more commemorative tree planting that happened across the UK. Was this something specific to Sheffield, but some more about the wider context you might know about? Well, my, I mean, my, my interest in the Sheffield fruit trees, I think, was sort of tangential to the research that I've been doing. I've been recently, well, not that recently, completed a PhD on a forester who was trained in the years after the First World War. Um, and through my research on this man called Richard St. Bart Baker, I came across a number of interesting examples. I think one which I find particularly powerful, which is the creation of tree cathedrals. Um, there are three, well, there are now, I think, four that I know about in the UK. It's one in Scotland, um, one outside Whipsnade, um, one in Milton Keynes, and a new one that a friend re only recently told me about in um, Gloucestershire and I think this these are sort of examples of tree planting on different scales so people who had greater access to land and who wanted to create something even more sort of spatially um, powerful I would say um, but again this idea that by using and planting trees something more evocative and more lyrical could be created um, so that's very much one of the one of the forms that I've I found very fascinating. And curiously, actually, um, so the project that I'm working on now, um, Women of the Welfare Landscape, one of the things that came up, and actually I noticed there were a couple of people from Wimbledon who, um, or not from Wimbledon, South London, um, who were attending the talk. And I'm looking at um, the legacy of Brenda Colvin, who was one of landscape architecture's sort of most prominent female practitioners in the 20th century. Um, I was struck by this, um, this account of her observations that during the Second World War, when the rubble of, de of destroyed houses was piled up in Hyde Park, that instead of it just being cleared and, you know, becoming invisible, that creating a, a mound, creating a, you know, a very visible sculpted form using this Trouble would actually in itself be a memorial to the homes destroyed, the lives lost. And I think that um, alongside or on top of her relationship, you know, friendship with a woman called Madeleine Agar, who was a very prominent garden designer and who designed a war memorial at Wimbledon Common, um, sort of 
gets to some of the yeah i'm just very curious about the ways in which designers puzzle out and solve these sort of these challenges of how to create places of meaning and how in the case of agar's um, memorial in wimbledon right it, it was very much designed with the idea that trees would be planted around it and that um, a grove of oaks would grow up around the memorial but in the early days it was really challenged by the fact that they couldn't plant trees of any significant size and so other trees other more sort of um, charismatic flowering species were put in to kind of create a bit more of a sense of it being like a garden and the oak trees really suffered so this real sense of horticultural you know arboricultural knowledge keeping pace with the necessity to deliver on meaningful memorials for people who, you know, at that most critical stage of loss and, you know, wanting to have closure, I think is, is just fascinating. So essentially I feel like there's a lot, there's a lot of work to do, even just on this one subject. Thank you, Camilla. I think that's that's a really interesting area to look at further. And uh, you, you spoke about earlier the, you know, planting long, trees that will be long lived and uh, it, it kind of has has made me definitely from my background at Woodman Trust reflect on the native non native debate and the challenges that go around you know planting trees in our towns and cities and looking at the right tree in the right place and uh, as a landscape architect as well I'm sure you'll have lots of thoughts on that is so is this something you might go on to look at further very much I think it's you know it's 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 a current issue you know both, both the the planting of new trees and the maintenance you know the care of those that have been planted historically um there and i think one of the things that is important is to recognize the you know the the real value of the people who are custodians you know that that it's it's not a it's not a responsibility that is taken on lightly it's not something that should be um what's the word Sort of unthinkingly shouldered by people you know we all have a we all have a responsibility to understand and to listen so i think that you know listening to the concerns of people who are responsible for trees is is essential really thank you camilla and i think that touches on when you were speaking about the western road trees that the the price tag was around five hundred thousand pounds to to retain those trees and it really gets to the heart of the price tag on what is the price tag on trees and that emotive connection to trees that people have and have had over a long time and that value of looking after them going forward and I think there are various tools out there like iTree for valuing you know treescape there are still very many elements of that you cannot put a price tag on and it's that emotive connection that you've spoken so well about um yeah. thank you Oh no, no, I was just going to say it's, it's, it's one of the things that there are two chapters in the street in the politics of street trees that address. So those actually no well, many more than that actually really, but looking at those sort of tangible and intangible values, um, both in a sort of economic and cultural context. So you know if that, I think it's something that we would all collectively benefit from understanding more. Absolutely. Uh, so I think it'd be nice we're getting towards the end of our time together, but it'd be great to um, hear about that you mentioned the charter for street trees at the end, and I wonder if uh, our discussion just now links into how you plan to take this forward. Well, I think that's, I feel like that's something we just are looking forward to hearing from our readers uh, about, you know, it's something, you know, we got to the you know, I'm pleased to say there isn't really anything out there like the book that we've edited and you know and I think it'd be clear to say that it's a book that has drawn upon like extraordinary levels of collaboration and cooperation so it's you know Jan and I edited it but we have contributions from over 40 different authors from different walks of life different so different parts of the world different you know professions and perspectives and all of those things coming together sort of meant that we were also you know, custodians of a of a large sort of volume of of meaning and um i don't think that the charter for street trees or what actually we've phrased as being towards a charter for street trees is perfect i mean you know it's probably something that people might very 
justifiably have thoughts about, but it's something that we wanted to sort of put forward. I mean, I know that the Woodland Trust created a charter for trees, but um, I think trees and streets hold a particularly challenging, you know, they, they represent real issues for local authorities. They are difficult and expensive to maintain and establish, you know, at the very least, you know, it takes, it takes a whole community to make them really viable. Um, and so across the sort of 12 points of the charter, we hope that we have kind of comprehensively addressed what we think would help create a more vibrant and sustainable, resilient, you know, urban canopy in our streets. But um, we very much, you know, I'm, I'm, what's it, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on, people want to find my email, they feel free to, if you, if you read the book and have comments or thoughts about it, I'd, you know, we'd love to hear from you. It's not, um, it's not something that we want to be fossilised in the book. That's really great to hear. And I think that's a really lovely point to end on. If you have thoughts or comments and anything, then please do get in touch with Camilla. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Camilla, for your time. Really inspiring and, and interesting talk today. Thank you to all of our participants for your comments in the chat and for joining us today. Please do take a look at the, the remaining events happening as part of the Urban Tree Festival. Uh, there's still quite a lot happening. We've got our final tree rings webinar happening at 1pm today on managing the urban forest on the Wooden Trust Estate. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for joining us. If you can make a donation to the Urban Tree Festival, it's completely run by volunteers. That would be fantastic. Uh, and we hope to see you at some of our future events. Many thanks. <laughs>